Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for being here on this beautiful, sunny summer afternoon um, for today's lecture, Travels with Hattie and Eleanor, Researching Biography with Barbara Cooney. It is my dear pleasure to introduce Alice Cooney Freelingheisen, or Nani as she is known. Nani is the Anthony and Lulu Wang Curator of American Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is, of course, um, a distinguished position at one of the world's great museums. As importantly, especially here in Maine, Nani is the niece of Barbara Cooney, the celebrated and beloved children's book author and illustrator who wrote more than 100 books over 60 years, many of them set here in Maine. In 2000, Cooney presented the museum with a large collection of original acrylic on silk um, uh, paintings um, that were created for use in her books. And last year, members of her family donated an additional group of preparatory materials, including sketches, book dummies, and related photographs. We are very grateful for these generous gifts. To celebrate this special collection, we asked earlier this spring three individuals here at the museum to curate an exhibition about Cooney's art, especially as it relates to the theme of women's uh, biography. For their efforts in realizing the exhibition, Barbara Cooney, Drawing Biography, I want to thank Laura Sprague, the museum's consulting curator of decorative arts, Honor Wilkinson, the museum's curatorial assistant, and Abigail Mahoney, class of 2016, a student intern at the museum during the last academic year. Um, not surprisingly, the exhibition has been a great popular success. We thought to shed further light on Cooney as an artist, as a writer, and as a researcher, uh, it would be um, terrific to invite Nani to be here to speak about her aunt. A graduate of Princeton University, Nani earned her MA at the University of Delaware's Winotour program in early American culture. And as a curator of American decorative arts at the Met for more than 40, 30 years, she has originated, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> whoops, <laughs> she has originated important research on topics ranging from early uh, American ceramics and glass to furniture and stained uh, glass. Of note are her exhibitions on American porcelain, Lewis Comfort Tiffany, the aesthetic movement, and the Herder Brothers, just to name a few. Also in 2009, she oversaw the curatorial team that reinstalled the American Wings Charles Engelhardt Court. The exhibition Barbara Cooney Drawing Biography here at Bowdoin, with its emphasis on the stories of three remarkable women, Miss Rumpheus, Hattie and the Wild Waves, and Eleanor, complements well the larger exhibition that is in the museum's downstairs galleries. This is a portrait, if I say so, Identity in American Art, 1912 to today. Both shows reveal the creative possibility for portraying the individual. When Barbara Cooney created her stories, she often turned to Nani, her niece. Given her appreciation of family history and extensive knowledge of American art and material culture, in today's talk, she will share some of the research undertaken to prepare the painting so beloved by Cooney's readers. At the end of the talk, we welcome you all back to the museum to see the exhibition with all of us. But without further de delay, please welcome Nani Freelinghausen. Thank you, Frank. And also, thank you, Laura, my dear friend and colleague. And honor, a great pleasure to meet you, and, and Abigail and uh, Absentia for the wonderful job that you've done on the exhibition. If you haven't seen it already, do come back after, after the lecture because it's, it's, it's really marvelous. And, I, and I, so I congratulate you, but I also think that my aunt, Aunt Barbara, as you'll be hearing a lot of, Barbara Cooney would be very pleased with 
how boat how the Bowdoin Art Museum is stewarding the holdings that she entrusted in in the museum by showing them in this in this fashion and and looking at her material in in new and and different ways so so it's it's much appreciated by me and I think probably much of her family and I will say we have two members of her family here um, her son Barnaby and his wife Susie and my dad who is um, one of her three brothers. Barbara Cooney, actually, let me, Barbara Cooney, um, as um, she was really very much a part of our life growing up. We spent a lot of time with her in summers in Waldeboro, with her, with her children, um, close, close cousins, many, many wonderful times, and time spent in their family house in Pepperell, Massachusetts as well. And as I was talking to Barnaby just earlier today, there so many of, of us could be standing where I am now because everybody who was involved with her, her family and friends, in-laws, cousins, were really a part of so many of the stories that she made and illustrated. And, and I know all of our stories would be slightly different. So today, you're getting my story. Um, but, but I'll tell you, she was in so many ways also an important inspiration and mentor to both me and my sister, Rebecca. In, in her extraordinary work ethic, her professionalism, her unwavering commitment to her field, her amazing attention to detail, ever a stickler for accuracy, and a deep reverence for the past and for her abiding love of family. And I think you'll see that that really comes out in much of what I'm gonna be showing you. And I'm gonna just start with Island Boy, which isn't in the exhibition, but, um, but, but there's a reason I'm starting with Island Boy. This, of course, was based on a true story. All of these are. They're all biographies. Of course, this is the only male um, <laughs> biography, and I've got a story about that, too, but, but that's, that I can tell you later. But it was the story of, of um, John Gilly, whose family lived on an island, Baker Island, off of Mount Desert Island. And hers is, is a, the kind of fictionalized version of this with Matthias Tibbetts as a young man in the early 19th century in Maine, in a, in a sort of farming um, um, on an island in Maine. But the work, I think, reveals not only her obsession with authenticity, but it also reveals in some more subtle ways aspects of her own life and her, the times that she spent on her, um, in her family homes in Waldeboro, Maine. Now, just, just to sort of show you, here is the drawing that's in the Bowdoin collection for, um, for the end papers that were used in Island Boy. And you all know the coast of Maine. Well, this could be almost anywhere on the coast of Maine with its inlets and islands. So, in fact, um, Aunt Barbara made it her own coast. And she, she did that in, in a couple of ways. Here you see it, the Great Broad Bay, right, right in Muscongas Bay, where, where um, our place in Waldeboro, her family place in Waldeboro is. And she personalized this. And I'll just, it, you, I could go through the whole thing, and, and Barnaby could add to that. But, but I'll just show you, for one, Hermit Wood. She put her, that's the name of the house that she built on the Damascata River. I'm happy to say the, the new owners are here in the audience too, which is just great, who love it. Um, the island, Cow Island, which her cousin owned and where she spent many, many happy times. The Flying Passage, which was what we, I mean, it's on the chart, it's where we, where, you know, that was the route from Cow Island back to Waldeboro. Or even up in the upper right, what she named Skank Corner. It's a little, you can see um, people with little gravestones. In fact, that is the um, sort of family cemetery, if you will, dating back to the 18th century of Andrew Skank, one of the early settlers of Waldemar, Maine, and her great, 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 whatever. Um, and, and much of it, you know, much of the illustrations, of course, for Island Boy could, be, could as well be anywhere in Maine. And, and you all could come up with your favorite, favorite places, but I'm quite sure 
that this is Harbor Island, which was another, um, another cousin owned, owned and, and she spent time on, or, or again, I'm, I feel there's a great affinity in this to, um, to Cow Island with the, with the um, saltwater farm house right there. Now, Waldeboro, of course, was the great center, as you all know, it was the home of the five-masted schooner. It was a great shipbuilding center in the late 19th, early um, 20th century. Her, um, her grandfather owned um, part, was a part owner of a shipbuilding wharf, and although these, aren't, these are not the actual sort of source material that she used, but when when the Tibbetts Wharf, which you can, you can see here, Tibbetts Wharf was depicted in Island Boy, certainly Waldeboro's shipbuilding industry was, um, was the inspiration for it. And I would like to sort of hazard that in fact, um, if you look at that wharf in particular, might, might in fact have been modeled on Storer's Wharf today, which is the only one of the seven wharfs down right in the center of Waldeboro on the river that um, were flourishing during, during the heyday of Waldeboro shipbuilding. Now I've got to keep track where I am on this. Um, let's, but, okay, to continue. Okay, so we're still in, in Island Boy. And I'll just show you just quickly some of, some of these, but they do really, I, I feel, are, are very much modeled on some of, some of her own family experiences. And so you have the, the, the farmhouse kitchen for Island Boy of Matthias and his grandparents with the great big um, stove in the background is, and of course the kitchen's been somewhat modernized, but I'm quite sure it's the home of her grandparents in um, Waldeboro. Um, and I show you this wonderful image because it was really this is the first time, and the reason I'm going, partly getting to this is that this was the first time that my aunt asked me for help on her book. And I'll never forget getting a call from her out of the blue. Um, and so let's see, this was 1988 when she was doing this. So, so it was probably in, you know, 1987 or 86 or, or something that I got this call um, asking me, was there blue and white striped mattress ticking in early 19th century America? <laughs> and I say that because that's the kind of attention to detail that my aunt cared about. And so there you have the pillow that has the blue and white, because indeed, yes, there was blue and white mattress ticking, striped mattress ticking in that, in that era. And there, there you have it. So that was really the, the beginning of, of really what became a um, wonderful, wonderful part of my life. And I just show you, I was kind of embarrassed that, um, that in the exhibition there's a letter um, that she wrote to me. I, I didn't see it until just, just now asking me about, about some aspects of, you know, could you check on this or, or that. And, but I did find... And, and just at my backtrack, you know, Laura, when Laura asked me, I thought, well, sure, I'd love to. Um, but then I thought, well, where is everything that I had pulled, you know, pulled together way back when for Aunt Barbara? And I'm not the most perfectly organized and filed area. But I did find this letter. It has no um, year. But, um, but this was when, you know, she, as you know, and you can see in this, in that book, she really admired um, these, these intelligent, strong, wonderful women, accomplished women, accomplished women in the arts in many different areas. So you've got Hattie, you've got Ellen, you've got Miss Rumpheus, and, and Eleanor, of course. And so this was, this was sort of like, you know, casting about, thinking about different people to write a biography about. And this was, I was, you know, very passionate about Edith Wharton. So I was, you know, sort of, you know, why don't you try, try Edith Wharton? And you can see that she, Edith, Edith doesn't touch in detail on many deeply personal matters um, of her adult life. And then, uh, you know, she goes on and on. And, it, and obviously, Edith Wharton really didn't fit the bill because she really didn't um, have that interesting enough of a childhood. Um, <laughs> so, but it just shows you the kinds of, I think it's, a, it's some insight into, into the way she, she thought about this. But of course, Island Boy really um, was preceded by Miss Rumpheus, and you see the the kind of dummy, um, which was which was how these books were were put together, and then um, and then as it is today, and it's so wonderfully 
presented, I think, in the original, exquisite original artwork in the exhibition. And, and I have to say, it's, it's so special to me on, on really many, many levels. This was, this was the book that, that, as you know, all of us love it, and, and we know so many people who do, but all over the country and all over the world, this book has touched a chord. And, and it became an unbelievable success. And she did this book when she was 65 years old. In fact, we are two days shy of her, what would be her 99th birthday um, today, which I think is quite wonderful and fitting. Now, of course, um, this too is based on a, um, on a real person, Hilda Hamlin, and I'm happy to say that she has many family members who are here. Her daughter, Barbara, and, and her grandchildren and great-grandchild are, are here today as well, um, of, of Christmas Cove, who indeed was, um, did sow lupin seeds across um, the state of Maine. But at the same time, many of the details were autobiographical to Barbara Cooney as well. And I think, again, reflect her love of home, history, and even her sense of adventure. And, and so, you know, to start, this is in the exhibition, and I apologize, because I didn't actually have, this is the book itself, but, but here you have Brooklyn in 1883, and there you have Alice Rumpheus, and William Rumpheus, her, um, is it her father or grandfather? I can't, anyway. Um, but, but William Rumpius is, is modeled after um, Barbara Cooney's grandfather, Aloysius Krippendorf, who you can see um, is in his workshop. And in fact, he was indeed a ship's um, figurehead carver and cigar store figure carver and a painter. There she is working, working away. So she's, she's kind of merged these two stories a little bit together. Um, yet again, autobiographical to um, Aunt Barbara was the library here, which is the Pepperell, Massachusetts Library on your left there. And this could be autobiographical for Barbara Cooney, but also to Hilda Hamlin, because the conservatory that she portrayed Alice Rumpheus in is in fact modeled after the Smith College Conservatory. Um, both of both those women were Smithies, so um, I think it's a, a wonderful connection that was made there as well. And of course her travels, and I used to be so envious, and my cousins would go off all over the world for Mother Goose in Spain, well, we had to know exactly how it looked, so off she would go with, with, with my cousins, and they would, they would travel around, and she would make all of her photographs and drawings, et cetera, et cetera, and here we have her in Indonesia. Um, but it really wasn't until Hattie came along that, that I became at, at all involved in some of the research that, that Aunt Barbara was doing on her books, and, and as you know, it's, Hattie is, is very much autobiographical. It's based on the life of her mother, May Bossert Cooney. And, and this, is, this is actually the, the dummy cover which wasn't used. But, but that, that image and, and perhaps even some of the idea for doing this book came from a page in a photo album that, that we, that I was hidden away in an upstairs closet in, in our family's summer home in Maine, which we brought out and we were looking at it together and there was this wonderful photograph that just caught the imagination and interest of, of Barbara Cooney. And it's this young woman, my grandmother, you know, standing proudly, look at that back, she's got her arms folded in front of her, she's on the beach, she's either in Far Rockaway or in, on Fire Island, we're not quite sure, but looking out to sea with that kind of determined expression, but maybe, you know, she, you know, the new American woman of the late 19th century, you one can read all kinds of things in it, self-confident and questioning, and I hope you can read, my, my grandmother had 
had as neat write, handwriting as did my aunt. And in that sort of typical photo album, black paper and white ink, she wrote her caption, what are the wild waves saying? Well, that just, again, like, wow, you know, just here you've got this image and then you have this wonderfully evocative quote that just, as I say, became the, the inspiration for, for that. But in fact, what we didn't really know at the time, that what are the wild waves saying, turned out that it was the title of, um, of a, of a um, piece of music that was based on, on a popular Charles Dickens story called Dombey and Son, and it was incredibly um, popular and well-known during the late 19th century. So you just see, here's a lithograph, there are paintings of it, there's countless sheet music of what are the wild waves saying. But that's not the way she looked at it. And this is here you have young, young Hattie or May Bossert looking out, in this case it would be from Far Rockaway looking to Coney Island. That's the Coney Island um, Ferris wheel in the distance. And just this is in the exhibition. And here you have her, you know, this kind of just putting together this book. Lots of sketches, very quickly done quick ideas, you've got the two different covers actually, she had that in mind very much from the beginning of this book. And, and one of the first things that we had to do, and she, I was just, well actually let me start with this, she found this wonderful photograph of my grandmother as a young, as a young girl, and then framed it in an original 19th century daguerreotype frame in memory of her, of her mother, May Bossert Cooney. But, we, but this was exciting for me. I've always been interested in family history, so here we were, roll up the sleeves and let's find out as much as we can. So the one thing that we, we learned, um, her father was a successful mill worker working in Brooklyn. He was a German-American, came over in the mid-19th century and, and developed a business in Brooklyn um, that turned out to be quite successful. And he built his first house in Brooklyn um, we knew the address, 1002 Bushwick Avenue, and so, and we didn't even know whether the house existed. It's way up in, in Bushwick Avenue in, in Brooklyn, not really a part of Brooklyn you want to spend a lot of time in today. But, but, we, um, but Dad, my father drove the car, and Barbara was in the car, and I was in the car, and we just thought, well, let's just... Could have been a total wild goose chase, but there we were. We were going to find this house, and we did, and here it is. Wonderful um, sort of Second Empire style house. It was built in the 1880s, or late 1870s or early 1880s, right in the center of Brooklyn where there were other German American, um, sort of successful German American entrepreneurs. Um, there were a lot of beer factories in that part of Brooklyn as well. and. We went, the house had seen, clearly seen better days. It was, part of it was, was a, some kind of Hispanic church. The other part of it was a fresh start, um, head, start head start organization, but they couldn't have been nicer. So we kind of did our knock on the door bit. And this is, of course, what it ended up being with a slate roof, wonderful brick detail. And in fact, I'm, I'm sorry to say it actually doesn't look anything like that, well, I mean, it looks a little like that today, but the roof has all been changed, it's no longer slate, all of the, the wonderful detailing has been removed, and it's added on to a little bit, and it's now a rental place for 35 apartments. Hard to imagine. But we did kind, kind of talk our way in, and, and I, I was able to find this snapshot, which I think probably I should give to Bowden, um, which is the actual, the foyer, or the vestibule floor, tile floor, this kind of fantastic, kind of, um, you know, very typical of the kind of patterning of the late 19th century. And, and, I, and I will just backtrack one minute to say that these three books just happen to coincide in period to where I've spent much of my professional career, which is in the late 19th, early 20th century, sort of looking at interiors, looking at furnishing, looking at decorative art. So it was a, it was a nice, dovetailing of, of interests here. But of course that tile floor then became the end, pi end papers for Hattie and the Wild Waves. The parlor at, at the Bushwick Avenue house, and here you have 
Louis Bossard, and you have Hattie, um, the, the young girl, or, or May, her older sister, um, Fifi in the book, but Beanie, or Philippine, in reality, and Bossard's wife, who was Philippine, Crippendorf, it was her father who was, the, who was the cigar store figure, and then the young son there, who she actually didn't rename in the book, he was christened Charles Volunteer Bossert, named Volunteer and called Volley because he was born on the day that the um, racing yacht Volunteer won the America's Cup. <laughs> Um, which is kind of appropriate for, for now against Britain's thistle. Um, can you imagine naming your, your son volunteer? But it does speak to how important yachting was to our great-grandfather, Louis Bossert, a, a total lifelong passion. But of course, what did the parlor of an upper-middle-class family look like? And this is where I was really thrilled to be able to, you know, show her tables and, and, and staircases and how pictures were hung. And I, it was just a couple of years after I had actually just completed the, the work on installing our own Renaissance Revival parlor that we call it in the American Wing, which you see here. And so I was really steeped in a lot of the research that was directly applicable to, to the work of the interiors of this house. Um, I, I couldn't resist showing you the kitchen again, which is because I think it's still modeled on that very same, her grandmother's kitchen in Maine, but just from a slightly different angle. And then, of course, the wonderful dining room view. Well, this is a glass and ceramics curator's um, heaven. So what are we going to put on the side, sideboard? What are we going to put on the table? And here um, gave a few, a few examples of the kinds of things, some in, some in the Mets collection. So on the sideboard, for example, the sort of examples of rich cut, brilliant cut glass of the late 19th, early 20th century. On the table, you have a decanter, which is, which is in fact our um, Metropolitan's press glass, um, diamond thumbprint decanter that would have been absolutely the kind of thing that would have, would have been used at that time. Now, um, I, I mentioned that our great-grandfather was a, Louis Bossert was a great yachtsman. He loved boats and had several. In fact, one was a steam yacht that he named after May, called Maita, or Maita, which doesn't survive today, but, oops, oh, wait a second, how have I missed this? Okay, let me, let me backtrack. I haven't gotten quite to that. Hold that thought, because this is actually a whole nother, a whole nother thing. Um, okay, this is another story, and I just have to, have to tell you this. In our, in our, um, in the main house, there was a, there was a, a barn, there's this enormous wooden crate in that barn, which had been there forever and ever. And, but it did say Opa Krippendorf. Opa was the word for grandfather, and that's what we often, or what the family would call their Oma and Opa was a sort of typical, typical thing. So we, um, we were kind of after my father to, to see whether we could open this crate and just see what was in this crate which we finally did, and, and it, I'm not talking, it's, I mean, it's huge. The painting is, this painting, which hangs upstairs, in the upstairs hall in our, in our house in Maine, is this big, with its original frame, you know, its huge frame out to here, was not, not in perfect condition, but, but of course I could, definitely knew it was, looked like an 1870s, late 1870s frame to me, but what is this picture? But it said on it, Cleopatra's barge. Okay, so this is Cleopatra's barge done by the same person who was doing those cigar store figures and figureheads. Um, this, and, and so it became a kind of, kind of a joke, if you will, in our family, really, and, and truly. But of course, we love Aunt Barbara for, for, for bringing that joke into, into Hattie and the Wild Waves. So the very precious painting that, in fact, may have been considered quite precious at the time because it was saved through all of those, those generations. And there is the family looking at this, um, this quite, quite unusual picture. Um, but of course, you know, it, it is a, the late 19th century. There was such an interest in Orientalist painting. And, and in fact, when you look at that 
that painting, you can, you can see it's very much of, a, of an academic painting. I was sure it was a copyist painting. And so indeed it is a copy of the, of a, the work of a, a late 19th century Austrian artist, Hans Mackart, who, and I'm sorry for the Getty images, but that was the best image I could find. Um, you can see it's an absolute direct copy, the kind of thing that artists were doing during this period. I mean, they still do it today for that matter. Um, this was painted by Mackhart in 1875. I don't know that it was ever in this country. In fact, I sort of doubt it because I think it was already in the museum in Stuttgart in 1876. But Hans Markhart was a very, very popular artist during the late 19th century in America, and their MFA Boston had, you know, had had exhibited his work. Other other museums were as well. So, so in, in fact, how you know, and perhaps it was probably engravings were known, and he, and he would be copying it from that. But but it is kind of kind of fun to see that um, engraving. Well, and then of course. For the research for this book, we had to look a lot to what, what we had in terms of old family photographs. And happily, there were quite a few in the family. I'll just show you the cover of one of these albums. And, and I just, here's, we would pour through these albums, and you can see my little post-it saying, copy for AB, I mean Aunt Barbara, um, of our grandmother with her dog Fifi in the book. And we knew that Louis Bossert had a seaside house, Breezy Point, it was called, um, and we knew it was in, um, uh, near Point Breeze in Far Rockaway. So that same wild goose chase, when we were going out to look for the Brooklyn house, we also, my father, you know, ventured to again, maybe even a less good area, I will tell you at the time, driving around everywhere trying to find this house and totally unsuccessfully. So it was much later that we learned that, that in fact, it had been, um, it, it had been purchased when, when Louis Bossert sold it. It was then torn down. A bigger house was built on the property, and then that has subsequently been, turned, been pulled down as well. But we did have several photographs of it, and so here is the wonderful um, late 18, 1880s shingle-style house that was um, right on the water. He was this yachtsman. He cared deeply about, about sailing and about boats. May or Hattie's sister was a great racer and she won all kinds of awards in some of the, the races and the littler boats that, that she sailed. He was commodore of the local yacht club and, um, and again owned, owned several, several boats himself. Well, he sold this house Oh, and, okay, and so during this period, actually, let me just backtrack. I, my order's gotten a little mixed up, and I apologize for that. Um, so at the time when he still had that house, I should say, in 1901, he purchased the Coronet, seen here, which was a 133-foot sailing yacht built in Brooklyn in 1885. Um, seaworthy comfortable and fast. It won all kinds of um, races. It boasted a marble staircase, plush upholstery, oriental carpets, even a piano, and refrigeration, which was an extremely important and new thing to have. He, it also had a, a, a plentiful and able staff, and I couldn't resist showing you some of these images, the one on the right with the chef, the steward, the, um, you've got a seaman in the back with his, with his uniform. The photograph on your left is May with her, or Hattie, with her father, Louis Bossert, in his, in his captain's hat as well. But I think it was really this image of the deck that informed, that would inform the illustration that she used in Hattie and the Wild Waves, um, where her sister is sitting on a deck chair that, that still exists, and, and her father with his, with his spyglass there. Hattie, of course, is at, right up at, at the bow, checking, checking on things there. Um, well, then there was, um, after all their sort of summer fun, and I, just, I, should rem I should just backtrack a little bit. Those photographs were actually 
these photographs were actually taken on a trip that Hattie, or my grandmother, took with her parents on um, Coronet when she was about 12 years old. So this is really her photo album. And all of these photographs are taken as it was anchored off of Havana, Cuba. Um, Coronet is the only surviving luxury yacht still in existence today, and I'm happy to say it's undergoing tremendous restoration in Newport, Rhode Island right now, and so maybe someday it will again sail, sail the seas and be anchored off of Havana. Um, but after all their, their summer fun, it was back to school, and, and we knew that my grandmother went to Packer Collegiate Institute in Brooklyn, and they were building a new building in 1907, and this image here is of the architect's rendering of that. It was published in their centennial history, so you kind of get a sense of the kinds of things we're looking at. Um, and there you see, as she's rendered that wonderful brick building, we did visit Packer on that, on that Brooklyn visit. And on the lower right, we actually found her graduation photograph, and there she is, the second from the left in, um, in the middle row. But, but our grandfather must have been doing rather well after the turn of the century because he not only bought the luxury sailing yacht, but in 1907 he bought a very grand house on, in Bayshore, Long Island, also right near the water. An earlier house, this is a house that was designed by the architect, American architect Calvert Vox for Henry Hyde, who had to sort of um, hightail it out of New York and out of um, the country for things that he had done. And, and the house came on the market and Louis Bossert purchased it. Um, really a fantastically sort of large and wonderful sort of shingle style house, which still survives today without the top floor. It's now Southward Ho Country Club in Bayshore. Um, and here's how Barbara Cooney rendered it. We have, a, we have a number of photographs of this, of the gates, which she's replicated there, some of the outbuildings. It was, it was quite a grand estate of about 150 acres, complete with farm buildings and conservatory and, and, and um, a grass tennis court and an elk park. We found the real estate brochure for this when, my, um, when our great-grandfather died. It was put on the market and there was a very in-depth, um, wonderfully descriptive real estate brochure. So we knew there was an elk park, which has really become a deer park here in her rendition. And the other thing we always were talk had the lure was about this um, swan pond with its black swans. And so I was able to find in one of the albums, there are certainly white swans. If you can see on the lower right, that is actually a black swan rendered there. And, and then, um, you know, in this case, really the album began to dictate some of what was being, was being illustrated. And, and other research was dictating this as well. But her sister became, in, was being courted by a, um, Yale man, who in the book was called Joseph Patrick Cunahan, but in fact it was Carol T. Cooney, um, my aunt's um, uncle, who you see here, and I'll just show you one of the pictures of her uncle, Carol Cooney, in the one of his cars. He loved fancy cars, and this just being, he also loved hamming around, which he, clearly he was doing here. Um, and, and you see here one of his cars, and I think that is actually with my grandmother, with May, in front of the Oaks, as the Calvert Box house was called, with his fancy new car, I wish I knew what kind it was, with a great big C for Cooney in the front of it. And you remember the image of the, the, um, the big blue Y on the white sweater, and here you have him kind of hamming it around with the, with the athletic sweater, and of course he was, he and his brother Russell were, were actually quite noted athletes while during their tenure at Yale. Um, but one of the things that I think really pushed this, looking at the courtship of, of her, um, of May's sister, Beanie, to Carol Cooney, rather than making that strictly of, of May's wedding, was when we discovered this wonderful 
description, we spent days and hours poring over the pages in the Brooklyn Historical Society of various newspapers, the most fruitful of which was Brooklyn Life. Now, of course, many of these newspapers are today digitized and searchable. This was not existing when we were doing this kind of research. So we page after page, and it's actually quite wonderful because there's no substitute for the sort of sense of history and, and, an, and an era and a period by, um, that, that you can gain from doing that kind of research. And so it, it gave fodder for all kinds of things, for costumes and, and, and customs and, and advertisements of, you know, there's a wonderful picture of her in her slip. You now know what, what period slips are because they were being advertised. But we really felt we hit pay dirt when we found the Cooney Bossert wedding description, as you see here. And this really, um, I think, was what, what gave um, Amp Arbor the idea to really um, make something of this wedding. And I'll just read to you just one description where she says, Miss Evelyn May Bossert, who was her sister's maid of honor, was gowned in rose satin, veiled by pale yellow chiffon and cream lace with which she wore a Charlotte Corday, of, Corday cap of pink tulle and lace and carried Killarney roses. Well, that is, that is the, the maid of honor there. Um, the little boy um, was modeled off of this image of her father as a page, in a page boy outfit. So it's a little bit, because her father really is actually the best man, but, but so she's taking a little artistic license. Here is that page boy outfit. Um, and then in 1909, um, Louis Bossert built a, a big, he felt there was no hotel in Brooklyn, so he built the Hotel Bossert in Brooklyn Heights on Montague Street, seen here shortly after it was built, and Barbara Cooney's um, illustration of it. It was at one point called the Waldorf of Brooklyn, better known for the fact that it was the unofficial home to the Brooklyn Dodgers, and it's where they celebrated their, their World Series win. Here, um, her rendition of the interior, you can see she's copying those wonderful columns, the, the chairs, the seating, the lighting, very um, close to what it was originally. Um, May or Hattie playing cards with her grandmother, which might have been a Tiffany, lantern sh uh, chandelier hanging above the card table. And she was up on the top floor. Um, they, ha they moved there after they sold Bushwick Avenue. They moved to the top floor and lived there. Um, in fact, Barbara Cooney was married there and was, um, you know, hold on. May was married there and Barbara Cooney was born there. Excuse me, <laughs> getting my generations just a little, a little confused. But she was already painting what she saw out the window of the Hotel Bossert. And this is kind of a wonderful, kind of goosebumpy thing for me. Here she's, she's showing her hanging up pictures of boats, because she would have seen those right outside on the East River and plenty of boats. But look at this picture when through another, through actually a stepsister of my grandmother, um, who I had found and, and friended and gave, gave me this little tiny oil of, and Aunt Barbara never knew this because this came after this book, of the Brooklyn um, um, steeples that she could have seen from, that she was seeing and painting from the top floor of the Hotel Bossert. And it's signed, it's the only painting of my grandmother's, and she did many, it's the only painting that I know of, it's actually signed M. Bossert. So we know it's before she got married while she was still living on the top floor. So. But, so that just gives you a sense of how close to detail um, Barbara Cooney was. And just um, on Tuesdays, Hattie would go with her mother and father to the opera at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And early views of the Brooklyn Academy of Music provided the source for this. In the 1909 Brooklyn Life, we were able to find that Louis Bossert was among the subscribers, and he, in fact, had box four, so of which this is, is modeled. And then, um, of course, um, almost ending with this wonderful view, the scene up from the cover where the older um, Hattie, now looking like that, that original photograph, is looking out over the Coney Island um, Ferris wheel with what are the wild waves saying, what will be her next step, and of course, 
my grandmother's next step was to go to Pratt Art Institute, seen here, which became the model. It just says Art Institute, but we know, we know that that's what it's modeled on. And, and so this was, a, was really a great experience, and we knew we wanted to get um, involved. So when Aunt Barbara decided to do the childhood of Eleanor Roosevelt, she again enlisted my help to, to join in on some of the research. And I do have, and, and, and there's a, there is a letter there. I, I came across another letter from Aunt Barbara. We did a lot of back and forth correspondence about, well, all kinds of little details and big details. But it's, it's really the christening that I, that I use as an example to show you how, um, you know, how important it is and how careful she was about the details that she chose to represent. If you're writing a biography of Eleanor Roosevelt, you say she was christened. You might not even say, but you might. She's christened in um, you know, 1885, and, and that, that says it. But if you're drawing it, you need to know a lot more. Well, we found the, the, her christening dress um, in the Roosevelt um, archives up the Hudson. I, of course, had fantasies of having this in Calvary Church. We found that she was christened by Reverend Henry Satterley, who was um, Episcopal priest and rector of Calvary Church with, so with wonderful late 19th century stained glass windows, and I had the image all in my mind, being a stained glass um, historian myself. Well, no, she was christened at home. We, so is, is Reverend Satterley old, young, short, tall, fat, I mean, so you need to get all of this detail. That has to be accurate, accurate in, in a picture book. So I think that's really the, the point that, that I, where this, this, real, this image for me really, really shows that. Um, some, she befriended a wonderful historian of, um, of, of, of um, ocean liners who helped a lot in terms of her trying to get everything accurate for this very traumatic incident of Eleanor's life when the Britannic and the Celtic had a collision in the fog of 1887. She was just a little over two and was literally lowered into a lifeboat um, and made her afraid of the water for the rest of her life, understandably. Eleanor, Eleanor's mother died when she was, when she was only, um, when she was 29, when Eleanor was only eight. And her father, Elliot, was notorious for his drinking issues and ultimately died of alcoholism or a, or a fall that, as a result of that before, she, before Eleanor was 10. But one of, there was one incident that was related where he was literally had left her and the dogs outside the, um, the Knickerbocker Club and its former guys, which you can see some of the details here as, as she's created them in this picture, and, and actually, finally, somebody rescued, rescued her while her father was inside. But, but I also think in some of the depictions of Eleanor Roosevelt's childhood, she's looking, she's looking to other things as well, and I, and I have to, to I mean, I, she must have been, been looking at one of my favorite paintings, Sargent's Portrait of the Boyd Sisters, very much of the same era in her frontispiece illustration of, of Eleanor Roosevelt to kind of convey that, that sort of, you know, that sense of, of that period and, and, and moment. Or in, in what's, what's one of my favorite illustrations is, of course, the Central Park scene, seen here, and wonderful. The, the original artwork um, is so much better than what I'm showing you here, but that is, it was clearly inspired by William Merritt Chase's, I mean, it's even the same vantage point of Chase's um, wonderful view of the boat pond at Central Park as well. And another sort of excursion was trying to find out some of the other homes, not just the New York City brownstone, but that she visited or lived in, one of which, of course, was her godfather and uncle Teddy Roosevelt's home in um, Oyster Bay, Long Island, Sagamore Hill. This is, this is as it looked, and my father was again chauffeur and companion on this trip. And there, uh, there is actually the, the actual sort of version and vantage point for, um, which Barbara Cooney used for that. And this a postcard which gave the original palette that, um, that is not used today, but that was the palette at the time um, 
that Eleanor Roosevelt would have been visiting her beloved Uncle Teddy. Um, her parents died, and so she went to live with her maternal grandparents, the um, Mr. and Mrs. Valentine Hall, and they lived in, in a wonderful um, Second Empire um, house in, up the Hudson called Oak Terrace. So this time it was with her um, wonderful editor, Regina Hayes, and I, and I think that's what the letter is referring to, is the visit we're about to make up the Hudson to see the archives and to, and to go to try to find this house, which we did. And I'm not kidding, it looked very, just like this. It was a little creepy. There was, you know, it was felt a little out of deliverance. Everything was completely grown up. And I won't mention about the people who were living there at the time. Um, in Tivoli, uh, New York, but right on the Hudson, and that then, of course, became in its grander day this wonderful illustration that Aunt Barbara did and conveying the, the, the kind of wonderful life of her, of her rowing on the Hudson to visit her relatives in, in other houses up, up the Hudson. Certainly, you know, sort of happy times indeed. And, and these are just a few vignettes which just, um, and I just have to say for me it was just an enormous privilege to have been able to be a tiny, tiny part of these, of these two books of Eleanor and Hattie's research. And so I think it's appropriate to close with this image, of course, Alice Rumpheus, but really thinking of Barbara Cooney and the beauty that she too brought to so many of our lives and the legacy that she has left in her wonderful artwork that we can see here at Bowdoin. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I know um, Laura said, asked if I'd be willing to answer questions, and maybe there are others in this room who can answer them better than I can. But um, but I'm happy, I'm happy to, or field them. So if there are any questions, I know there's some microphones here. Well, the, the question was, if you, if you didn't hear, how much was Barbara Cooney um, involved in gardens and gardening? And I think I'm looking at Barnaby and Susie, and and well, I just you know even the captain's house or 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 Hermit Wood. She always had wonderful flowers that I remember um, in all of her homes. Barbara. And 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 Hilda Hamlin. This their is connection. this is Hilda Hamlin's daughter, Barbara. Daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-law. Pardon yes. me. Pardon me. I said that. Uh, and Hilda and Barbara must have been soulmates a lot because they were very much alike. Although Hilda had no artistic talent that we know of, but um, Hilda was was introduced to Barbara Cooney uh, first by a friend in Christmas Cove who was to be Barbara Cooney's freshman roommate at Smith College. And she brought her to meet Hilda Hamlin, who at that point was working at Smith College. And so they became friends from then on. Now, along the way, Hilda Hamlin lived to be almost 101 years old. Hmm. and her memorial service we held on the house in Christmas Cove, which is pictured in the book, Miss Rumpheus. And at the end, and Barbara, at the end of the service, somebody asked her, would anybody like to say something? And Barbara stood and said how much she had enjoyed knowing Hilda Hamlin, how wonderful Hilda had been at uh, spreading lupin seeds around the state of Maine. And she said, 
and she certainly made my life more beautiful. Ah, lovely. Any, any other questions? Well, it looks like the timing is just right. It's 529. <laughs> and, and maybe um, if you would like, we'll, and those of you who haven't seen the show, for sure, the museum's open late, and it's open now, and we could go back, and if you have any questions there, I will definitely be there. Barnaby and Susie will be there. Barbara Hamlin will be there. Laura and Honor will be there, the curators. Um, so maybe, maybe that's, that's what we should do. <laughs>